Okay, I'm going to start. No one's here on Zoom, but someone's watching these recordings, right? So not many people are watching the recordings either. <laughs> um, so, uh, right, I'm just going to start talking about this again, I guess, unless there are questions that were before. It's those in the assembled masses. Um, <laughs> Um, right, so um, I want to start by talking about another aspect of what it is to be a body. Um, oh. um, which is, I mean, I guess, Last time I was emphasizing being a body in, I guess, well, I don't know what I was emphasizing, but anyway, <laughs> what I want to emphasize this time is that have, being a body or having a body means taking up space, extension, and, um, and there's a limited amount of space. Of course, there isn't really a limited amount of space. There's lots of space, right? But uh, there's a limited amount of space around here. <laughs> and um, for Coates, and I think, I mean, um, I think maybe for Blacks in general, this comes to a focus in like on a sidewalk or in a doorway um, or at the end of the escalator, right? Because, um, I mean, this is like, he doesn't say this when he talks about what happened in those places, but I, I, I think he must be thinking because that's a situation where like traditionally the black person was supposed to step out of the way um so um right so one place this comes up is when he's in new york and he's um trying to understand why the dreamers are are quote unquote, utterly fearless. Now, I mean, I said last time that I think in the, you know, his his final opinion on that is that they're not fearless, that they're consumed by a fear that they can't acknowledge, right? The fear of awakening from the dream or something like that. But nevertheless, uh, they're not conscious, they're they're not consciously in fear. So they they look like they act like they're utterly fearless. And he says, I did not understand it until I looked out on the street. That was where I saw white parents pushing double wide strollers down gentrifying Harlem boulevards in t-shirts and jogging shorts. Or I saw them lost in conversation with each other, mother and father, while their sons commanded entire sidewalks with their tricycles. The galaxy belonged to them. And as terror was communicated to our children, I saw mastery communicated to theirs. Right, so the way this manifests itself is that um, there, if there's limited space, um and you know as you know if you don't have a body like an angel then you can a lot of a lot of you can fit onto the head of a pin right <laughs> but if you do have a body then someone is going to have to give way um um and uh um and it's i mean like, I don't think he thinks that the mothers and fathers on these gentrifying Harlem boulevards are literally teaching their children. Uh, like if, you know, if you meet a black person, they're supposed to step out of the way. And of course, that is, there was a time and place, I don't know whether this is true in Manhattan or not, or certainly in the South, there was a time and place where people were explicitly taught that, right? But, but he is saying that they're, they're teaching them that you know they don't have to worry about taking up all the space. Um, 
And uh, I guess more importantly, well, I mean, I don't know if it's more importantly, but um, it's more striking as a single incident in Coates's life, right? This thing that happened when after, when Samori was five and they had gone to see Howell's moving castle. I remember seeing that. Um, and uh, um, and they're coming, they're getting off the escalator and Samori is moving slowly as a five-year-old child will sometimes do. It's, you know, like when you want them to move, Slowly, they move quickly, and you want to move quickly, they move slowly. <laughs> right. So, and I mean, I think everyone who's been a parent of small children and still remembers it, <laughs> remembers this experience of other people who are not parents of small children, or it's been so long that they don't remember what small children are like, getting really impatient with your with your kids. <laughs> And wondering why you can't control them, and you know, like, it's, I wish I could control them. <laughs> but, um, uh, but uh, it means it means something completely different to Coates than it would to me, right? So a white woman pushed you and said, "Come on." And that pushing that's that is extreme to push a five year old child out of the way, right? But a white woman pushed you and said, come on, many things now happened at once. There was the reaction of any parent when a stranger lays hand on the body of his or her child, right? So, I mean, he's acknowledging that this, that this is a type of experience that any parent could share. But then he says, and there was my own insecurity in my ability to protect your black body. And more, there was my sense that this woman was pulling rank. I knew, for instance, that she would not have pushed a black child out on my part of Flatbush. I was only aware that someone had invoked their rights over the body of my son. I turned and spoke to this woman and my words were hot with all of the moment and all of my history. She shrunk back shocked. So, I mean, like for him, then he goes on with the rest of the story and he's, you know, he basically, he feels ashamed that he lost control of himself and endangered himself and Samori in this situation, right? Because afterwards, you know, in the, ensuing argument this white man is saying you know i could call the police <laughs> um so uh um but i mean all of that is the important context for coats but i think the thing that's important about it from the point of view i'm taking now is just that yeah it's again it's this it's this situation where the space is limited and we're all bodies. Um, and what that means is that like one body excludes other bodies from its space. And the question is which one is gonna exclude which one? Um, and of course, this is also like somehow related to the red line that defines the ghetto. I mean, Coates alludes to this several times in this book, but I, we know that he did like, uh, you know, a huge project reporting on the history of this, of redlining and how it created the ghettos, um, right? Which again is a way of, um, like we're saying the black body will have to fit in here. Um, and the rest of it is reserved for the people who um, believe themselves to be white. So, um, and so I think this is at least one of the uses. I remember last time I was saying that I'm not sure what he's doing with the kind of running science fiction metaphors in the book. But I think one of the things he's doing with it is so like again this is difficult i can't claim that he's alluding to this that he knows this text <laughs> right? but but i think he's he's 
he knows the principle that's in this text, which is Kant's uh, doctrine of right, the Rechtslehre in the in the Metaphysics of Morals, and the axiom basically of the doctrine of right is that the surface of the earth is finite. Right, which is, I mean, it's it's surprising actually that Kant brings that in there because you, it's like, of course, in some sense, an empirical fact, right? I mean, maybe the earth, maybe the surface of the earth is infinite, right? Like, how do we know? Only by experience. <laughs> so, um, um, but uh, but nevertheless, when like when Kant. Um, introduces the part of the metaphysics of morals that's about justice, pop property rights, public law, all of that stuff. He starts by saying the surface of the earth is finite. So um, um, so when I said, you know, like space is limited around here, even though there's lots and lots of space, the surface of the earth is, is finite is another way of saying that. Okay. Um, there's plenty of space out there, but we're not out there because we're held by gravity to this surface. Um, and um, so the dream, um, Again, in opposition to consciousness, which means knowing where and when you are and being in your body. Um, the dream involves the moving in a space that seems infinite beyond the attraction of gravity. Um, right, so he starts, this, this metaphor of gravity is, starts early in the book, this is on the bottom of page 20. I knew that my portion of the American galaxy where bodies were enslaved by a tenacious gravity was black and that the other liberated portion was not. I knew that some inscrutable energy preserved the breach. And this is one of the places where he alludes to the title of the book. I felt but did not yet understand the relation between that other world and me. I think I read this in the, I, I read that same passage in the first lecture when I was worrying over the meaning of the name of the book, right? But here I'm focusing on the gravity part, right? So like, um, so now like the way I drew this, so I guess I could say in real life, this is the situation. Um, there's a finite space in here, but there's also a finite space out here. Right, I mean, um, there's only so much, the surface of the earth is finite. Um, but from the point of view of the dream, um, and I mean, from the point of view of the dream, but also from his point of view, when he's growing up um, in Baltimore, it seems like the people here are held onto a finite surface by gravity. But the people here are floating free in infinite space. And I mean, when I say there, I mean, floating free might, might, might not be the right word. It's, I don't know. Again, I don't, I don't know. Um, whether I'm reading too much in by bringing in this, what I'm about to say, but the, of course, also in real life, it's not true that when you leave the surface of the earth, you're beyond the reach of gravity. Right? Like, um, you know, if you're in the International Space Station, you're like 250 miles above the surface of the earth, right? So you're like barely farther from the center of the earth than we are. If it stopped, it would fall like a rock. <laughs> it's the reason you seem to be free of gravity is that you're falling, right? You're freely falling. 
and yet you like as many hitchhiker's guide to the galaxy when they like instructions for learning how to fly is that you throw yourself at the ground and then get get distracted and miss <laughs> <laughs> that's that's actually the space station is too, right? So, um, and since everything in it falls at the same rate, it's as if there's no gravity, right? So, um, so like what's what's really going out here on out here is that things are freely falling. They're in free fall. That's the that's the like the liberation um, of being off the surface. Um, and, um, and part of that is that if you're going fast enough, meaning if you're falling faster, right? Like, because, um, you don't have, right? you don't have to keep firing your engine to do this. Bodies in motion remain in motion. Right, you just have to be going at the right speed to begin with, and then fall. And if you're falling fast enough, then you they'll come back. <laughs> right, and how fast do you have to fall? Well, that's called escape velocity. Right, if you're, if you're going at escape velocity, then you know. So, I mean, it's not really true that you go on a straight line. You'd be like. Is he going on uh, hyperbola probably if you you know if you started here? But it's it's not a returning path, right? You're not coming back. Um so um so the in coach several times uses this metaphor of escape velocity. Right, so right there in the same passage I was just reading before on page 21. Um, I felt this as a, I felt in this a cosmic injustice, a profound cruelty, which infused in it, which infused an abiding, irrepressible desire to unshackle my body and achieve the velocity of escape. Right, so it seems to him like here, where he is, is um, tied to a surface by gravity, and up here are people freely falling, um, and he wants to get up here and achieve the velocity of escape and never come back. Um, um, And he knows that, or supposes that Samori may feel this even more strongly than he does, right? This is on page 24 at the bottom. Um, um, you may feel the need for escape even more than I did. You have seen all the wonderful life, life up above the tree line. Now that's kind of a mixed metaphor. I don't know how the tree line came from here. But anyway, you have seen the wonderful life up above the tree line, yet you understand that there is no real distance between you and Trayvon Martin. And thus Trayvon Martin must terrify you in a way that he could never terrify me. You have seen so much more of all that is lost when they, when they destroy your body. So, um, so he thinks that this way he used to think about it when he was growing up in Baltimore is going to seem even more tempting to Samori, but he um, but he thinks it's the wrong way to think about it. Um, so and somehow Trayvon Martin comes back in this in this explanation. This is on page one twenty nine, so it's much later in the book. Um, and they're in Paris in the summer. Um, and uh, they come across 
someone, a young man standing outside a subway holding a sign protesting that Trayvon Martin's uh, killer has, um, well, I guess it's an acquitted, was he acquitted or he wasn't even, I guess he was acquitted. First he wasn't charged, but then he was charged, then he was acquitted, something like that. Anyway, so, um, and Coates says, that was the same summer that the killer of Trayvon Martin was acquitted. Oh, okay, I should just read it. The summer I realized that I accepted that there is no velocity of escape. Home would find us in any language. And then he tells that story of seeing the protest sign. There is no velocity of escape. So, like, um, So this, so this picture, this metaphor was wrong, right? I mean, because like in real life, there is a velocity of escape, <laughs> but uh, um, this metaphor was wrong, or maybe we should have compared the Earth to a black hole, right? <laughs> so um, uh, you can't achieve freedom that way. Um, and that's somehow related to um, the fact that he's calling America home. Home would find us in any language. So in this way, this thing about the, um, the finite space that bodies have to move in and have to negotiate with each other is like somehow bears on this question of Coates' relationship to America, which I was discussing last time. Um, like, does he agree with Malcolm X and say, I don't consider myself to be an American? Um, and um, it seems like, at least at this point in Paris, the answer is, no, doesn't agree with that. So like a simple version of what happens to him there would be to say that, you know, despite the, the joy that he experiences while he's in Paris or while he's in Europe in general, right? And he first mentions being in the train station in Geneva. Um, um, the joy and fear, but it's a, it's of course somehow a different kind of fear, right? I mean, he's a, he's afraid to go to France, and in the in the train station in Geneva, he's afraid because he suddenly realizes that if he got on the wrong train, he could end up anywhere, Vienna, you know. No. So, um, uh, but it's a fear that's mixed with joy, and it's very similar, I think, to what Du Bois, ex, you know, records experiencing in Europe. But at the same time, and again, this would be a simple version of it. Like at the same time, he realizes that America is home. Um, and that this would be something like what I claimed about later Du Bois. Now, I mean, I'm not sure about it in Du Bois, but, but uh, I mean, I made a very like complicated um, interpretive argument, which maybe, I don't know if it really works, but trying to reconcile different things in, um, in dark water. But like what I, what I, what I said is that when Du Bois looks at America from the outside, he sees liberty facing France, right? And it's like, you know, Lafayette, we have returned, like that whole thing, um, seems to make sense, but when he looks at it from inside America, either in America or in France, from inside America, what he sees is um, like as if this country could be a champion of democracy, right? And as for France, the reason they're having this war is because they're fighting over the right to divide up the, the, the colonized world, the plunder it, right? So, um, so like that difference in viewpoint suddenly, and I mean, the difference in viewpoint, 
again, I guess maybe what I'm saying here is simple is that like the simple explanation for that, that once you're outside, you realize that um, nevertheless, despite everything, that's that's where you come from. That's your home, right? So, um, and he says something like that. Um, this is on page 124. He's sitting in a public garden in Paris, and he says, it occurred to me that I really was in someone else's country, and yet, in some necessary way, I was outside of their country. In America, I was part of an equation, even if it wasn't a part I relished. So, like, so from France, home means America. And I mean, you can, like, if you go through, again, I was able to do this part by, by doing a text search, <laughs> um, that um, if you go through the book, you see that um, uh, before this point, he, he mostly uses home to mean just the place where someone lives, right? Like their home, you know? So like my parents' home, I saw a black man losing his home, right? Something like that. Um, and then there's kind of a transition where home means Baltimore. Um, this is on page 85. Um, I always thought I was destined to go back home after college. I assume that means not that he thinks he's going to live in his parents' um, house again or whatever, but um, but that he's going to go back to Baltimore. I mean, I think that's pretty clear that if you read the rest of the paragraph. I did love Baltimore, blah, blah, blah. I always thought I was destined to go back home after college, but not simply because I loved home, but because I could not imagine much else for myself. And that stunt of imagination is something I owe to my chains. Um, and yet some of us really do see more. Right, so so in that passage, home means Baltimore, and the opposition to home is, well, for one thing, Howard, right, Uni Howard University, but more importantly at this stage, New York, because, right, because what he actually does after college is not move back to Baltimore, but move to New York. Um, and it's because some of us really do see more. So the people who see more are his wife and his friend, Ben, um, who Samori calls Uncle Ben. Um, so, but he's not really his uncle. I tried to actually to Google and find out if I could find, if I could, if I could find out anything about who Ben and his wife are. But uh, I realized that what I mostly got when I tried to Google stuff from this book was a long list of like Sparks notes and stuff from this book. <laughs> uh, I wasn't, but I didn't I turn up any information on that. So, but anyway, um, and I mean, maybe it's better, I don't know, maybe it's better that I don't. After all, he could have said Ben's last name in the book and he didn't, maybe he didn't want to. Um, but so in any case, these are the people who um, who have seen more than him and, or who see more than him. And because of that, they draw him on to New York and then also to Paris. Now that thing about seeing, um, Is I think it's a first hint of something that later in the book becomes a big theme. And when he says that that stunted imagination is something I owe to my chains, it's um, it's a first hint of something that becomes more explicit later on page one sixteen. But oh my eyes, now. 
I guess that's kind of an expression, right? Like, oh, my eyes. But then it turns out that he's actually talking about his eyes, or at least metaphorically, right? But oh, my eyes. When I was a boy, no portion of my body suffered more than my eyes. I guess it's not metaphorical. That's the point. It's my eyes. It's a portion of my body. If I have done well by the measures of childhood, it must be added that those measures themselves are hampered by how little a boy of my captive class had seen. Right? So I, I take it he's talking about the same thing in those two passages. On page 85, where he says, my imagination was stunted by my chains. And here, when he says, my eyes suffered. Um, and if I had done well by the measures of childhood, it must be added that those measures themselves are hampered by how little a boy of my captive class had seen. Right, that he couldn't um, he couldn't imagine um, he couldn't have imagined being where he is now when he was a child, and therefore by that standard it seems amazing. Um, so, um, but uh, but somehow that has to do with what affected his eyes. And the same, I mean, this at numerous places this theme comes up in the later, later parts of the book. But um, but the other one that I wanted to mention is, um, which also seems closely connected to those other two passages. After he meets this new friend in Paris, um, and they you know they go have like wine and, and food together and. Um, but and the whole time he's worried that this guy is like trying to, you know, is planning to um, um, get an angle on him, <laughs> as he puts it. Right. So, um, but actually, it turns out the guy's just being friendly. At the end, he like shakes his hand and says, "Have a good evening," and walks away. Right. So, and Coach says, and watching him walk away. I felt that I had missed part of the experience because of my eyes, because my eyes were made in Baltimore, because my eyes were blindfolded by fear. So, like, I don't, I don't know if I understand everything that's going on with this. I think, I, I think I don't actually. Um, but I think I understand something about it. And I mean, say what I understand about it. And this is gonna come back to what I was talking about before. <laughs> so, um, but to say what I understand about it, I'm gonna have to bring in Descartes again. Um, so, um, because uh, in the first meditation, Descartes or the meditator also emphasizes their eyes as well as hands, the hands and their eyes. Um, and at the point of um, wait, what is this point exactly? At the point where the meditator is just about to completely reject the evidence of their senses, right? So that, you know, the first meditation, there's a first part which is directed at the senses, and then there's the second part that's directed at reason. So this is like right before the transition from one to the other. And the meditator says, but now certainly, um, with waking eyes, I um, view or look at who I are, I intuit. <laughs> now, certainly with waking eyes, I intuit this paper, right? Because again, we've been established that the meditator is holding a paper. And I mean, I think what I claimed before is that the paper the meditator is holding is the paper on which the meditations are written. Right? So the meditator is the reader, not the author, I think. 
So uh, anyway, so the meditator is holding this paper and they say, but you know, um, um, it's just after the dreaming argument. And they say, but uh, just after the first stage of the dreaming argument and anyway, and they say, but now certainly I'm looking at this paper with waking eyes. Um, so like, um, I think the reason the eyes and the hands are emphasized in the meditations is that the eyes are like the, the, the body's way of intuiting things. And the hands are the body's way of grasping things. And like when the soul, um, uh, at that point in the first meditation has to give up on the body, um, finds itself like stranded like a sailor without its ship. It has to, um, it gives up on that, that way of, that form of intuition and that form of grasping something. Um, I guess I maybe I didn't read um, maybe one part of the quote on page eighty five that I didn't read. Um, the one where he's sitting in the. Page 124, sorry. But sitting in that garden for the first time, I was an alien. I was a sailor, landless and disconnected. Right, that's the, um, that's that's one reason I compared the soul at this point in the meditation to a sailor, because that's the metaphor that Coates uses. But, um, um, it's, in the sixth meditation, when Descartes is uh, recovering, or like when the, when the meditator is supposed to recover the body, um, one step is to say that because I feel pain in the body, my relationship to the body is not that of a sailor to a ship. Um, to bring in this part or not. I'm going to say, I'm going to say this. I don't know what, I mean, like, this is probably less relevant to what I'm trying to get to here, but it's, but it has to do with the way I understand the relationship between Descartes and Coates that like you can imagine that the meditations are also a letter from a father to a child. So uh, Descartes' daughter, Francine, um, um, died in 1640. She was a little girl, she died in 1640. Um, the meditations were published in 1641. So like, She's already lost her body. Um, and, um, and yet I feel like Descartes um, is thinking of her as reading it, but she can't, right? And she can't because it, this, and I mean, I think from, from that, you can see actually how little consolation dualism actually is to Descartes, no matter how extreme it is, right? Because so like if, yeah, you could say Francine's mind is still somewhere, 
but she can't grasp his paper. She, she can't read his letter. So as far as he's concerned, she's gone. Um, so in any case, like I said, that's that's that has something about what I what I think about the relationship between Descartes and Coates. Um, it's, but it's a little bit of a digression from what I was trying to to arrive at here, which is that like so suppose you take materialism so seriously, then you might say, well, um, the mind's way of um, grasping or intuiting is derivative from the body's way of doing it. Um, and so, like, what the mind does here is what Descartes and Hobbes and other people call imagination. Right? It's like, um, so that is, for, for Descartes, as a dualist, there's a, there's a way the mind grasps things and there's a way the body grasps things. And once you lose the way the body grasps things or the way the body intuits things, you're left with the way the mind does it. And that's why there's a second part of the first meditation. But like, if you're not a dualist, then you may say that the way the mind does it. And so therefore, Descartes also makes a strong distinction between imagination and thought. Right, like if I met, like with my thought, I can I can perceive a kiligagon, a figure with a thousand sides, but with my imagination, I can't. But um, but if you're a materialist, then you may say imagination is thought. Um, and who says that? Um, Hobbes. <laughs> Hobbes says that, and where does he say it? He says it in the very passage that Coates quotes in his blog <laughs> in 2013. So, um, so like this is the place where I feel like, yeah, maybe Coates really is thinking about. It. So the 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 um, the no escape velocity. Um, the, the fact that it's in some way necessary that um, that where you came from is home and you can't escape that will find you in any language um, is somehow related to the fact that your thought is always in the end it's just imagination and whatever has whatever gravity holds your body holds your imagination down to. Um, but somehow I'm not sure I'm putting this, these pieces together as well as I could. One is just not going off on things that I that I'm interested in, that Descartes or whatever. But I think um, um, and as I said, I'm not sure I understand what everything Coates is doing with the eyes. Um, but but what I do what what I what I think I understand at least is when he says his eyes are damaged, that um, and that therefore his thought is damaged. Um, um, his thought is stunted. It sounds like an unmitigatedly bad thing. <laughs> my, my, you know, my imagination, my thought are held in this finite space, and I can't get beyond it. But, um, 
I think it's actually like somehow part of the wisdom he's trying to, to transmit with some words. That, um, that, that, that when you think that you read your thought from your, from like the environment of your eyes, in which your eyes were made, that's, that's when you're dreaming. Right, like that's because you know dreams are where the imagination keeps working, even though it's no longer connected to the senses. Um, so you're not really imagining new things. You're just, um, as Descartes also says in the first meditation, it's it's like all you can do is recombine the things you've actually seen. Um, so therefore it's from Paris that talking to Samori he, it's like Paris is the site for discovering this <laughs> and it's from Paris that um, talking to Samori he refers <clears throat> to not to Baltimore but to America as home Right, this is on the bottom of page 146. You are here now, and you must live. And there is so much out there to live for, not just in someone else's country, but in your own home. Now, I mean, you could imagine this feeling being, this experience being, and it seems like that when it happens in Du Bois. Although, I mean, Du Bois doesn't say this, right? I mean, like all I can do is compare different parts of the book <laughs> as I did before. So, um, but it's it, it seems like, Du Bois has a kind of positive experience about America from this point of view. Um, I mean, well, there's some, there's obviously there's something positive in what Coates is saying about it. There's so much to live there, not just in someone live for, not just in someone else's country, but in your own home. Um, you know. Uh, um, and later he talks about um, the the beauty that that um, in created by Black America. He says that I have seen with my own eyes, <laughs> right? So there's something positive about it, but it's not. Um, I mean, all I can do is like. So I remember having a similar experience. <laughs> Um, I was, you know, in Israel, seeing the American flag flying over the consulate in Jerusalem, and think, and just like maybe kind of unexpectedly having a surge of emotion, like that's my flag, <laughs> right? Um, and uh, um, but you know, like uh, the feeling I was having there is. Um, Obviously, it has got to be a lot different from the feeling that Coates is having in Paris. I mean, you know, um, this is like the first place in a thousand years where they haven't lynched us. <laughs> it's it's almost the opposite experience. So. Um, so what is Coates feeling about? And I think, you know, This is why I'm going to try to explain that. So, like for Coates, the the rejection of nationalism, it does mean counting America as home. 
or at least when he comes to realize the full extent of that, when you know, um, it it um, it means counting America as home. So it, it's so he is really rejecting Malcolm X's not only Malcolm X's reasons for violence or for dissenting from the nonviolent civil rights movement. I mean, because I think in the passage we'll read in a second, you'll see that he that he has. You know, all those things that he said about the way the civil rights protesters appeared to him when he was in school. Um, there's a lot of ambig ambiguous points in this book where he uses the past tense to talk about his beliefs, and you're not sure if he means now he believes something else or does he still believe it. But, um, but I think um, um, in the passage, I'm about to read, you can see that um, that he doesn't think of the nonviolent civil rights movement that way that he used to in school. Just as he doesn't think about French lessons the way he used to in school. Right? When he was in school, he agreed with Booker T. Washington. This is the very thing that Booker T. Washington and Du Bois argued over, French classes. For, for four boys in the South, right? Um, Booker T. Washington said, can you imagine anything more useless? <laughs> um, so like when, um, when Coates was a boy in Baltimore, he agreed with Booker T. Washington. But now that he's a man in Paris, he says, I wish someone would have told me what that French class really was about, right? Um, so, um, so, but I think it's also true that he like has changed his mind somehow about the civil rights movement and also has changed his mind about, is, is rejecting Malcolm X's reasons for saying, I don't consider myself an American. But it's not a happy feeling, <laughs> right? On the contrary, it, it, it feels, it has that, threat of like cynicism or pessimism, depending on whether we use Coates's term or Grant's term for Grant's term for it. Um, and this is what he said, this is on page 146. Um, I thought back on the sit-ins, the protesters with their stoic faces, the ones I'd once scorned for hurling their bodies at the worst things in life. Perhaps they had known something terrible about the world. Right, so when he scorned them, he, that's when he was, um, that was his being a Malcolmite, right? Um, because they were, they were, you know, throwing away the sanctity of the black body instead of trying to defend it. So it says, Perhaps they so willingly parted with the security and sanctity of the black body because neither security nor sanctity existed in the first place. Um, and then, um, a little bit farther down in the paragraph, we are captured, brother surrounded by the majoritarian, majoritarian bandits of America. And this has happened here in our only home. And the terrible truth is that we cannot will ourselves to an escape on our own. Right, so I mean, you, uh, the rejection of black nationalism and of um, Malcolm's scorn for the nonviolent civil rights movement and for um, and the realization that America is home um, all come through this terrible knowledge. Um, Um, 
the terrible knowledge that neither security nor sanctity existed in the first place, and we cannot will ourselves to an escape on our own. So, right, so I mean, for one thing, obviously this is connected to what I was talking about before about struggle versus goal orientation, right? That um, this, so this realization that America is our home, it comes together with the realization that um, um, there is no space where, like, there is no space where uh, we could move our body into and, um, or that we could clear out <laughs> such that we could move our bodies without hindrance. Um, not on our own. So all we can do is struggle. And, you know, I mean, I think this is, you know, when West says, when Cornell West, who, by the way, declared he's running for president, which you don't hear that. But, um, so, uh, and also wrote an editorial in the Wall Street Journal about how DeSantis classical education program was a great thing. <laughs> I don't know what's going on with that, but in any case, um, so when Carl West says that code like um, ignores the importance of black fight back, as he puts it, I mean, this is basically exactly the same thing that um, um, Michael Ignatieff said about his uncle, I think, George Grant was his uncle, <laughs> right? That uh, um, that uh, rather than go down fighting, he's he, he wants to go down smirking. <laughs> um, right. So uh, you know, I mean, uh, it's true. He used to believe in that fight back, but now he believes, as West says, like you know. Well, it's not exactly what West says. West says it just turns into a private aesthetic movement of writing, but um, but that's not true. It's not private, um, and it's not um, passive. It's struggle. Um, um, it's so like um, in fact, right after the part I'm reading on page one forty six um is on page one forty seven is the discussion of the home the trip to homecoming at Howard University that he brought um Samori with him to and um uh, And he describes what it was like at the tailgate party. And then he says, that was a moment, a joyous moment. This is page 149. That was a moment, a joyous moment beyond the dream, a moment imbued by a power more gorgeous than any voting rights bill. This power, this black power originates in a view of the American galaxy taken from a dark and essential planet. Right, so like at that moment he says, I do still believe in black power. <laughs> I haven't given up the idea of black power, but this is where black power appears. Um, in this um, tailgate party at, at uh, Howard University homecoming game. Um, um, and this and the black power originates in the particular view that um, that we have of the American galaxy because we're the ones who are awake. <laughs> um, so, but it's not a power either to like escape or to conquer. It's, uh, it, although it is a power to struggle. Um,
I might finish early, but we'll see. Um, right. So, um, so there there is an identification identification of America as our home, and the idea that. Um, um, I could put this stuff together better. Um, well, maybe if I just go on with what I was going to say, maybe it will come together better. Um, because uh, right, I guess this is this is the way for me to continue from this point. So. Um, so again, the re the rejection of, um, I mean, and as I said before, when I when I first talked about this, when I say rejection of Malcolm X, it's I mean it seems clear that uh, um, he doesn't think it was a big mistake for him to you know to be to love Malcolm X, right? Like maybe rejection is too strong a word here. Um, like he still appreciates all the things he appreciated in Malcolm X, and maybe this thing about black power is a, is is partly a way of emphasizing that, right? So, um, and um, um, but but his his move away from Malcolm X, um. And his move towards saying, you know, you and I, we're Americans. This is our country. This is our home. Um, that, um, um, and therefore rejecting this. So this was farther down on page. Uh, on page one forty nine. So page one fifty. Um, right, he remembers Prince Jones mother, Prince Jones's mother having said to him that, you know, this country is is doomed. Um, and he said, uh, I had heard such predictions all my life from Malcolm and all his posthumous followers who hollered that the dreamers must reap what they sow. I saw the same prediction in the words of Marcus Garvey who promised to return in a whirlwind of vengeful ancestors. So, um, um, so he says, like, that's not right. That's not the right way to think about it. But it's not because he's become a flag waver. <laughs> um, so it's because, um, and again, it turns out that the reason is that, like, it's worse than you think. <laughs> um, Um, I left the Mecca knowing that this was all too past, knowing that should the dreamers reap what they had sown, we would reap it right with them.
So there's no escape means not just that um, um, not just that we can't get away from what the dreamers have done to us. We're stuck here in this gravity. Um, um, the dream is resting on us, right? And he says the beauty that Blacks have created is like diamonds created under the pressure of the dream. Um, but that there's no escape doesn't mean just that there's no escape from that. But it means there's no escape from what the dreamers are doing to themselves. There's no escape to what the dreamers are doing to our country and, and our world. And there's only one world. <laughs> um, there's only one world. Um, we're the ones who are conscious that we're in it. <laughs> they're not conscious that they're in it. Um, right? And so this is how the passage continues on page 151. Something more fierce than Marcus Garvey is riding on the whirlwind. Something more awful than all our African ancestors is rising with the seas. The two, uh, let me skip that part. Well, no, I guess I can't skip it. The two phenomena are known to each other. It was the cotton that passed through our chain hands that inaugurated this age. Right, I guess the theory being there that the industrial revolution would have been impossible without cotton produced in the American South, or anyway, maybe not that it would have been possible without it, but that that's how it actually started, something like that. Um, it is the flight from us that sent them sprawling into the subdivided woods. And the methods of transport through these new subdivisions across the sprawl is the automobile, the noose around the neck of the earth, and ultimately the dreamers themselves. Right, so the the, the same um, um, dream of freedom from gravity that is that uh, um, in real life is crushing us is resting on us. Um, is also the um, is also the thing that's destroying the world. And and I think this is important. At the point where Coates is thinking this, he is sitting in a car. <laughs> he's sitting in his car idling. And he's thinking there's no escape. We're in this dream uh, that, you know, the dreamers have created this world where we get around by automobile and the automobile is destroying the earth. Um, um, it's, um, again, there's no escape. We can't think an escape on our own, right? Like, you know, in other words, he's not saying, so let's us make sure not to drive cars and whatever. Um, because that won't that won't work. Um um so like It's a version of the thing that um, Du Bois says against the black colonizers, like Marcus Garvey, right? He says, like, um, there's no point in going to establish a colony in Africa and thinking you'll be free there because um, look at what's happening in Hawaii and the Philippines. America will find you there. No place is safe. Um, but now um, the terms have changed because Coates understands that Americans, himself included, are using up the finite surface of the earth just by living with it. Um, 
So it's um, it's not just that America will will like will find you wherever you are and oppress you. It's that America, um, yourself included, is part of what's destroying the whole world, and there's no escape from it on the finite surface of the earth. Um, and How did I skip this part? Well, I should have read this a long time ago. I knew this would have helped my. <laughs> I keep thinking, why is my lecture not coming together right when it looks like I skipped the whole page somehow in my notes? <laughs> um, but this is the the thing that I should have read about this a long time ago on page one forty three. Um, I am convinced that the dreamers, at least the dreamers of today, would rather live white than live free. Right? So first of all, like, what he thought when he was a boy in Baltimore was that um, the lack of freedom was for the people who were confined to this finite surface by gravity. And the, the, the people who sent him those dispatches from beyond the uh, Asteroids onto his, his television set. Um, those were the people who were free. Right? But now he says, um, I am convinced that the dreamers, at least the dreamers of today, would rather live white than live free. I don't know which dreamers of what other time he thinks maybe this wouldn't apply to. But in any case, this is what he says. In the dream, they are Buck Rogers, Prince Aragorn, an entire race of Skywalkers. Prince Aragorn doesn't fit that well there. That's not really his title either. <laughs> anyway, um, an entire race of Skywalkers. To awaken them is to reveal that they are an empire of humans, and like all empires of humans, are built on the destruction of the body. There, um, um, they're not free. They're like that captive that Descartes mentions who has been enjo enjoying an imaginary liberty in dreams and now is afraid to wake up. They think they're Buck Rogers or a family of Skywalkers, meaning they think they're free out here and there is no finite surface that they're on. Um, but of course, like in real life, their their body is between the sheets. Right? They're they're right where they always were on the surface of the earth. Um, um and the only thing that's holding them up at all is the bodies underneath them. <laughs> um, so, uh, um, and now heading back to what I was saying before. Um, The way the dreamers are destroying the entire world is um, it's America. Meaning what? It's 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 somehow tied to the ideals of liberty and equality, the way the way they've actually manifested themselves in American history. Um, So, um, um, so you might say, uh, so, so, so you might say, well, what we have to do is fight for freedom and be free 
and equal and um, get rid of this America thing. But it would be a mistake because um, this problem uh, can only really be confronted by America. But by by the true America, right? By the only true America, that is by like America awakened. So, um, so that like the escape, not an escape from gravity, but an escape from dream and an escape from destruction, would. Um, um, would have to be an American escape. We can't do it on our own. Um, and then, you know, and then the, this is the pessimistic part. We can't and shouldn't count on that happening, right? Like he says to Samori, maybe the dreamers will wake up. Maybe that's what the civil rights movement, movement was trying to accomplish. Maybe it will happen, but don't count on it. <laughs> don't arrange your life around that. Um, so, um, so it's close to Grant, but it's not quite like Grant, right? I mean, Grant is saying that, um, Grant thinks those American ideals are bad in themselves, basically, in themselves, basically. Um, the only way to escape it would be to reverse those ideals, right? And replace them with tradition um, or something like that. And he says that that's impossible, that can't happen. So the necessary is not the good and, you know, et cetera. But what Coates is saying is those, um, and I guess like in the end, that's why, um, I think by his own lights, he's an American philosopher. Um, that he's he's saying um, the only cure for for America would be America. Um, but there's no um, there's no guarantee that that will ever happen. There's no reason to think that that has to happen. Okay. Um, that's all I had to say. It's a little bit early, but um, I, I, what, maybe I feel like I should say something in conclusion about the whole course, but I, but, and I tried to think of something like that yesterday, but I couldn't think what to say. Um, um, the course could have ended different ways, right? Like rather than reading this at the end, we could have read probably something by my teacher, Stanley Cavell. Um, that would have been a very different direction to go on. But um, did I want it to end this way because I wanted to end on a pessimistic note? No, I mean, uh, am I pessimistic? I don't think I could be pessimistic the way Grant or Coates are. Um, like I, I think they would say that I could. <laughs> the feeling has to be different for me. Um, uh, so, like, if I if I did say something at the end to conclude the whole course, I might try to say something like. Um, Well, what though? I 
mean, isn't Coates's pessimism as optimistic as you can be? <laughs> right? Um, I mean, isn't this, yeah, the, um, the way I was just interpreting. It's, it's true. Uh, it's true that America is the most noble and greatest civilization ever to exist. Only not the real America that actually exists. Because <laughs> right? that one is definitely not. <laughs> but the only true America is the one that is. <laughs> right? And, um, uh, and, you know, and then if you add, but don't count on that ever coming to be, well, like, of course not, right? Like, how could you count on that? <laughs> so, um, so maybe I should end by saying that this actually is, is an optimistic place to end the course. <laughs> um, all right, anyway, I will leave you to consider that. Um, and thanks very much especially for those of you who kept coming towards the end of the quarter. Um, and uh, if, I, if I don't, those of you I'm not about to see in another class, have a good summer. <laughs> um, oh, and one more thing. I'm not planning to hold like scheduled office hours after this, but if you need to or want to talk to me about something, just like get in touch, okay? All right. Thank you. Bye.